Helen Silner is the remarkable driving force behind Tala Music Week, the Estonia-based showcase event that is hugely influential and embraces other cultures outside music and other ideas, from film to cooking, from art to music to politics to culture. It's an all-embracing and powerful and inspirational event. This year, of course, there have been unique challenges. The event was originally meant to be in March. It's now at the end of August. Helen speaks to me about how she's going to put the event on and how she's going to react to the problems and the challenges presented by COVID and also the future of music, the future of music events, the future of gigs and how we're going to deal with life post pandemic. It's all music week, so you put it back a few months, but now it's going to be the end of August. So what's your feelings? Optimistic, pessimistic? Yeah, it's been uh, quite a ride in a way. Uh, we were first uh, supposed to happen in the end of March. And then we were just literally f the first festival in Estonia that had to make the decision to postpone. So we already made the decision to postpone into August, uh, then in March. And we felt being very safe with the August dates. And of course, uh, we all know what happened meanwhile. Um, the virus uh, spread all over the globe, as we know. And then, uh, of course, there, there, there was a moment of hesitation in between. And we really didn't know which way it's going to go. But uh, somehow it seems that in Estonia, we've been able to uh, get the virus under control quite nicely. So uh, it was a week ago when the Estonian government made the decision that in July and August, the public events are going to be allowed with uh, considerable restriction, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we made a, you know, another announcement that we reconfirmed the dates for the August. And uh, of course, we keep our fingers crossed because uh, it really depends on uh, how the situation will kind of evolve. But uh, it looks optimistic now, yes. What's the, what's the current situation in Estonia? You say it's under control. I mean, how, how under control is it? Well, I mean, the pace that we're looking towards is that we get, let's say, uh, average of five to seven people infected per day, which is really, you know, it has really, really slowed down. Uh, I can uh, kind of Google and take the statistics in front of me, but it means that um, the new, the amount of new infected is really do uh, down and uh, the virus is not continuously spreading. So, um um, in fact, this uh, Sunday, the state of emergency is going to end in Estonia. And uh, they already opened the borders with Latvia and Lithuania, not yet with Finland. Mm. Um, so it's kind of happening step by step. So what precautions are you going to need to take for Tallinn Music Week? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the, the first set of restrictions has to do with uh, capacity and the amount of people allowed into venues. And uh, they make a difference here between indoors and outdoors. For the indoors, its uh, top capacity is 500, and for the outdoors, it's 1,000. And thanks to the fact that Tallinn Music Week is the type of a festival where we use multiple venues around town, so we don't even end up in a situation where a large crowd would gather all together. So in com combined, uh, the total capacity of the festival, of course, is larger than 1,000. But um, the way that the virus spreads is uh, it really matters w what's the amount of people in a tight, closed in um, environment altogether. But of course, in addition to the capacity um, restrictions, there is a certain amount of, you know, really, really need to allow for bigger venues so that people are able to keep distance from themselves. Uh, you, allow, you need to really think about the gates and the ticket sales and also the bars and the cafes and all the social areas. And, uh, you know, a set of restrictions on how you keep the hygiene. And uh, there's a special, basically, demands rider for how you clean up. And, and this is very detailed and, you know, kind of like, on, after every three hours, in a way, you need to allocate for the venue to be completely empty, then to kind of open the windows and do the cleaning and then open the venue again. So, so of course, it means we need to do changes uh, in a way we're set up in the festival, but it means that we can go forward as well. So, for example, in a, a 200 capacity venue, how many people are actually allowed in it? 
Well, uh, there's still a little bit of confusion. I mean, in Estonia, there's been this uh, rule that we call two plus two, which means that every other person needs to keep two meters of a distance from each other. So if we go by that rule, and if that still applies in August, we need to allow minimum of four square meters around each individual. Mm. So kind of as an example, it means that if your venue is, I'm just looking outside of the win window, there is this uh, one of the popular venues in the Teleski Creative Hub called uh, Vapalava Independent Theatre, which is kind of like the audience area is 400 square meters. If we divide it by four, then uh, what would normally allow around 4, 400 people as a capacity, now it allows for 100 people as a capacity. Hmm. So, of course, it means the costs will arise and we can sell less tickets, but it's still better than, uh, you know, not doing anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> what about the performers on the stage? Do they all have to keep two metres apart? Well, uh, we haven't defined that, uh, but we have defined uh, the amount of meters that need to divide the performance from the audience, and that's uh, four meters average. But I mean, everywhere it's been said here as well that uh, you should keep distance from the people who you don't know. If you're, you know, musicians on the stage, you probably all know where you traveled, uh, you know, what's your health status and everything. So the risks are considerably lower so you know within a group of people who you know and you feel secure with it's uh, not an issue what about uh, the international side of it the borders open you're saying with with latvia and lithuania was it but um, other countries no one knows yet i mean is it going to be much more of a localized event this year or is it going to be an international aspect yeah, this is, um, for the moment, the question we don't have a final solution for, and it will clearly depend on how the countries will open up themselves. I was just talking to the um, representative of the European Commission here in Estonia yesterday, in fact, and he said that in the level of EU, there is this discussion that starting from June, borders, they need to allow for free uh, uh, movement between the borders. but. Um, Another element of it is, of course, uh, how will the airlines pick up? And uh, one thing is, you know, there, there's two layers of this uh, same situation that, okay, the borders of the countries may open up, but if there's no uh, means of transportation available by that time, so that's another obstacle. So, um, of course, um, we feel kind of um, our focus this year is really to try and help the local music community is one of our first tasks. But as part of these tasks is also helping the local musician uh, and uh, to help more better broader context abroad. So we don't, of course, want to lose this component. Mm. Um, so we have like three scenarios, local, regional, by which we mean probably, let's say, Nordic Baltic. Um, a question mark is uh, about Russia, of course. And then uh, the, the third one is international, but there are also scenarios, you know, we can um, think about, we're thinking about um, hybrid event where we have the physical and um, virtual presence. So these are the kind of decisions we don't make right now. I think um, it's much safer to make these decisions in June when we really see what other countries are doing. It might end up in a way like it was first scenario in March, when we were still uh, about to go forward, then our strategy was that, okay, we do the festival, but we really uh, consult with the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and look at what is considered the risk countries at this period of time. At that time, it was obviously China and North Italy. So we might go back to this type of thinking as well, that, you know, some of the countries which are doing well in terms of keeping the virus under control might be okay to travel over to Estonia and uh, maybe some of the countries are seen as uh, riskier. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think this is something we are in any case not able to decide upon ourselves as a festival. I think this is something we need to work together with the local authorities with. Yeah, because I mean, the talk of uh, international travellers and quarantines, getting in and out of airports, although in the UK you can still fly in and walk straight out of the airports, but in normal countries you have to quarantine a little bit. I mean, 
Well, that, that, is that the same? Is that the same Tallinn Airport? Is, are people still flying in there? Or? Yeah, the, the flight. Well, for, for the moment, the flights are happening only for uh, specific courses. It's not for normal tourism. But if you really, first of all, the transportation planes that keeps on the goods to travel. And then the second phase, I think, is to do with uh, people who just really give a reason why they need to travel. But the guarantee um, for keeping yourself uh, distance for two weeks, that remains. But I've heard also countries who will consider approach that, for example, uh, to accept a tourist from a certain country, they need to provide a kind of a week-long uh, type of a test uh, that you've been tested for the virus. So if you've been tested negative, you can travel. Um, so that, of course, uh, the condition of that is that testing is widely available in all of the countries that you all can go to and get a test done really easily. So that's one of the options as well. This is something that might be an option, you know, it's like the international artists that we want to host or the international guests we want to visit that, if possible at all, we ask them to provide a test. Mm -hmm. But let's see if that's... Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of things we don't know yet. So we, yeah. we've decided to take it a step at a time, but we decided to make the, the first big decision and, you know, kind of like confirm we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, not knowing the 100% full scenario yet is okay. So we take it step at a time in phases. <laughs> so when you talk about uh, the virtual and online side, does that change as well? I mean, a lot of people are saying this this could be one of the good things that comes out of the virus is that people, uh, they're doing the conferences and gigs. They're not so much in the venue or, or super localised. Everything's got an international aspect to it now. And is this mm -hmm. something that you, I mean, you already have explored it before, exploring it further yeah well of course uh, I think this is uh, been quite interesting to observe that um, I think what the virus has done to the creative sector everybody got their online shops uh, kind of shaped up <laughs> and uh, uh, everybody has been watching um, <clears throat> streamed live concerts or theater pieces or has been visiting museums virtually stuff like that uh, so we definitely will focus on getting live streams from the live uh, kind of the poor performances, but we also acknowledge that we need to really step up the quality in this as well, because um, it's been really sweet and heartwarming to look at the home gigs. But I think if a festival is starting to do live stream, they really need to prove that they can put in like a, an upgraded quality element in this as well so this is something we will be discussing with our production companies with you know how we can make the venues look really good and the sound and the lights and really to kind of complement the virtual experience and in terms of the conference as well i think in the conference setup it will work even i think easier because uh, We've all, I think, been able to take part of these webinars and uh, also hybrid type of events that let's say 50% of the participants are there in a room, but like some of the speakers and some of the participants will join in over digital channels. And maybe this is the future of um, seminars and conferences. Maybe it is our way to kind of cut back on our carbon footprint on the traveling, you know. <laughs> so I think this has been one of the really interesting things to learn during this period, that we, we don't have to do that many meetings and we don't need to travel and meet and go to conferences every week. We can save up a little bit of time and also uh, save, the, save the environment in a way that we minimize our travel and we really think, where do we need to travel and then, and then you know make it as an online presence I'm just really hoping that um, and I think uh, well hoping from one one hand but also I believe that um, this doesn't result in uh, international communication kind of slowing down so I'm really hoping that uh, we don't go back to really kind of a national approach uh, that we kind of take care of the local as much as we can, 
but we we really make an effort to continue collaborating and uh, talking to people internationally as well. I mean, surely, uh, I would have thought a place like Estonia is really well placed for this. The country invented Skype, uh, a small country, um, sort of on the on the edge of Europe in a way geographically, but in, in an era that we're moving into where communications are like this a lot of the time. This has got to be something, a place that you're, you're really beautifully placed to move on this, aren't you? We're in Estonia, we're Tyler Music Week, future thinking country with culture. There's a future mapping out there, isn't there? Yeah, I think so. Well, of course, we've been talking about the digital development in Estonia for a while, and now it's the time to really prove it. We we don't know why everybody's using uh, Zoom instead of Skype these days. <laughs> but uh, Zoom's actually better for recording. And Skype's yeah. glitchy, so maybe, maybe you need to go speak to Skype and tell them to make a better version of it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But I mean, uh, we both were part of this uh, some initiative called the Global Hack. And mm-hmm. it was quite interesting to see as well there. Uh, that within uh, 48 hours, people around the globe, it was something initiated by Estonia as well, were just really coming together to find new type of solutions. So, in fact, one of those projects that was coming out of the creative um, theme there is now going to host this kind of a digital venue platform. And these guys are really developing this service as we speak. So... So we know already a couple of projects in Estonia that came out of this um, hackathon type of uh, thinking. So I think we already are in a good context in terms of digital development here. And the people here, citizens, are really used to having their services online. But I think uh, there needs to come another layer on top of it. And we talk about quite a lot, you know, what's the innovation that's going to come out of the cultural sector. I personally don't think that it's um, enough of an innovation to play a gig and stream it. But I really think the innovation needs to be kind of like more integrated into the uh, creativity that we produce. So something we haven't been seeing that much yet is, for example, the use of virtual reality. It's, It's like because the service is quite expensive still. But the more there will be, I witnessed something really interesting. The the city of Helsinki did a huge one uh, in um, the 9th of May. They had the Vappu, which is the sort of a Finnish uh, celebration there. They had this traditional uh, main square event uh, in virtual reality. And they had, I think, over a million participants and 150,000 people participating, picking up their avatars and being part of that. So um, I think this is something very exciting. Let's see if there's going to be more virtual reality happenings as well. So so I think if we look at what's happening in gaming, which is doing a lot of uh, innovation and the quality is rising, uh, and from Estonia comes this uh, disco and asylum, uh, they, by the way, British Sheep Power made their soundtrack, which is uh, cool. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, exciting stuff happening in the gaming section. Once the sort of arts, music, film, gaming, innovation, once they start doing in- interesting things together, I think this is when we see a new type of quality in there as well. Mm. So, so in, in a way, are you optimistic about the future? You know. Um... In, in a sense, this, this has actually been a good show. I mean, obviously, the, the virus is not good, but it's given us a shake-up and a, a chance to rework how we do things. Mm. Well, I'm a, I'm, I think I'm always going to be an optimist. <laughs> I can't get rid of this. <laughs> so uh, I'm the type of a person when I get energised by when things are changing. So when there is a hope that we can replace some of the um, things that have been kind of stagnated. So we can kind of like turn things around a little bit. I think that these moments in society are always an enormous moment to make positive things happen. Of course, you know, that there's an equal opportunity for positive and negative things to happen. But what it means, it's a time for change. And uh, these are the periods when, you know, um, the status quo 
can be shifted in a broader sense. Um, of course, there's a like endless amount of articles of people speculating how it's going to end up. My biggest fear is, truthfully, that there's not going to be any change at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm hoping, uh, I'm really hoping that, um, you know, it's the, the kind of feeling that the change is around the corner. You, you feel it's there, but you can't quite look at it yet. You know, you kind of feel it. It's right there, but uh, you don't know what it is yet. No. Yeah, I mean, I think the forward-thinking people move forwards, and the Trump people will move backwards, but just faster. Yeah, yeah. Well, but but something. Um, I think it's a time when uh, the kind of like true quality of things uh, is easier to come forward. Uh, you know, it's uh, things that are slow and stagnated. They they really are left behind, and things that have life and like real creativity and ideas in them and passion, they are bound to move forward. And what is uh, positive about this period of time, I think what I've experienced is that the level of collaboration has really been increasing. The kind of, we really mentally get the point that we're in this mess together. Mm. That, that, you know, there's nobody who has a better privileged sort of a background in this situation. So, in terms of equality, I'm thinking it's a time when uh, sort of historic privileges doesn't don't matter that much. It's your current um, ability to innovate, to collaborate, and to move forward. So I think, um, in a way, it puts us in a similar threshold, and that needs to be a positive thing. <laughs> oh yeah, completely. I mean, um, let's just say, let's go two years into the future. And this is not a particularly fair question. It's just a guesswork. Um, a band's coming in to play Tallinn, maybe not even Tallinn Music Week, just a concert. How, how much different will it be, that kind of event, than it would have been three, four years ago? Will it be a live cast gig? Will they fly in? Well, you know, there's all these things getting changed now. Or will it just be the same as years ago? You know, because rock music can be very backwards looking as well. Like, it can be very Trumpy in its thinking. Or will it, everything be a move forward? I mean, how... I mean, what would you like to see it be, and what do you think it will be? Hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing we did a little bit of a survey uh, approaching some of our, you know, audiences and artists, and uh, asked them a, a set of questions. It was quite interesting to see that people believe that digital will have a bigger role, but let's say eighty percent of them said that nothing will substitute the real live experience and people coming together. So um, I think, and I hope, um, th that's what I've been hoping for a while, but now especially I hope that the quality of sort of well-curated, smaller boutique type of events and initiatives will have bigger value because... Uh, I mean, maybe the virus will kind of tell us that these huge mega events that just mainly rely on headliners and, you know, get together 70,000 people in one big space. I'm sure some of them will stay and I'm sure people love them and there's a, there's a place for them. But I just really hope um, that we find more of those smaller initiatives that rely on unique identity that are really carefully curated in terms of their artistic vision and I'm really I've always been hopeful for um, a broader cross-sectoral collaboration that music events would do more collaboration with arts design film um, urban activism things like that so so my my hope has always been that somehow something would kind of shake us up from our mental world where we built built in silos. You mm -hmm. know, it's kind of like our whole society is built with you know we have ministries. Somebody takes care of the social affairs. Somebody from education. Somebody environment. Somebody culture. And then within these ministries, there's music. There's film. There's um, literature. And, you know, the way we're governed it has 
trained us to think in silos. The budgets are also divided in these kind of fractions, and we're trained to think like that. And I'm just um, thinking that maybe it's the creative sector that helps somehow to kind of start this healthy um, cross pollinization, or how do you call it, between uh, these disciplines and sectors because. Well, I've been thinking about it so much, I think, um, you know, the people who will make a difference in a future world, there's this interesting term uh, uh, called a generalist. I'd like to see this type of people more in our leadership who are just, you know, have some knowledge in politics, in, I don't know, political science, but in psychology, in arts, in philosophy, you know, it's kind of maybe this is the future renaissance man or a woman you know who, who really comes uh, comes from this uh, combination of knowledge of the different sectors and discipline and thanks to that has a new level of a helicopter view mm. that just has a broader understanding of the society thanks to that well after i mean after all these huge events you know like after every pandemic or world war there has been big changes in societies mm. and these could be the changes that come out of this couldn't they then i mean yeah. they're not, they're not necessarily one massive change but there could be hundreds of small changes that, that with, everything shifts on it so that that's that's a good view of the future i mean are these themes that you'll be embracing at all music week this year well uh we started out uh, with the, the core theme of sustainable development um, and of course that theme will remain always relevant and this will not disappear. And uh, this type of cross-sectoral collaboration has been on the agenda for us in Tallinn Music for, for years. <clears throat> now we just really need to think how we make it relevant. When We've really analysed, you know, that okay, our core you know, target group with whom we, you know, to whom we need to be useful is still the music sector and the musicians. But we want to really play it out in a way that this cross-sectoral knowledge really has been perceived in a way that uh, music can benefit from it. You know, because sometimes when you become being too broad, people don't understand it anymore, you know. How is, it, how is this relevant to me? So, you know, it needs to be cleverly built that you actually benefit the people and um, kind of um, uh, sectors that you should cater for. So there's a lot of thinking. and uh, But I think that uh, the biggest mistake is if we all copy-paste what we've done over the years. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's this time to shake up... Um, our habitual behaviors i think brilliant thanks helen that's a good point to end on yeah <laughs> yeah so uh yeah so i'll use that for the interview so uh is what well you got a busy day on now or is, is it, was that it i <laughs> uh, no, i actually i i took this chance to come to the office and make a full uh, office day today uh, on monday we have this big uh, deadline and we need to issue our Mm -hmm. set of costs for the Ministry of Culture, you know, the unreturnable costs. Uh, so we're hoping to get some kind of a refund from the government. So mm -hmm. I need to work on that. Yeah. Do you still want me to um, do the Dale Vince interview and things like that? Or should I sort that out with Ingrid? Or Yeah, definitely. We want to do that. But mm -hmm. I think we're now it's, a, it's an interesting moment when in a way we start... Hmm, we need to take the whole program in front of us again from the start. Mm. And the, the fact that our agreement with Dale Vince was to do it as an online in interview is excellent. It's because, already, uh, yeah, well, it's already in the future. Yeah, it's already there, <laughs> already in the future. So I can't see uh, no reason at all why we should not do this. But I think the way we're going to move forward is that to have real kind of like premier interviews uh available online as well and then to have really practical master classes when people can participate in a much more sort of like uh active way as well not just only listen so so my my big question is that what do we do with these traditional panels 
I don't know if they're relevant at all. So I think we need to, we move forward more like very interesting presentations and interviews that we can spread digitally as well. And then really hands-on practical workshops. Mm. I don't know, does that make any sense? Like a TEDx plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people do what? Well, TEDx is 17 minutes, isn't it? Talks, which is actually quite good for online. So a little yeah. short, sharp talk, so you get the points in fast. Or maybe yeah. maybe just very well um, done, like, Q&As with people to get the information out. Because not everybody, some people have great ideas, but aren't very good at talking. So that they yeah. need to the ideas pulled out of them, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They can be done online and, and in physical, can't they? Yeah, exactly. Both. Yeah. So so we're going to be working I, I, on this now. People pay for live cast tickets as well, don't they? I mean, I, I, there's a friend of mine who actually makes a living out of uh, being, being an agent for live cast events, selling the tickets for them. Oh. Well, that's the thing. People, it seems to me that. People don't have the habit of paying for digital events uh, yet. No, but, like he, he, but he does. He sells tickets for him. He's already he's been doing it for a few years. Oh, that's he's interesting. Building it up. So I'll put I'll put him in touch with you because he knows he knows how to he knows how to get the information out to people who would buy those kind of tickets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but maybe really maybe you said you can send me a link or what they've done or something like that. So maybe. Maybe there is a reason to collaborate with somebody who's really good at that already mm. and has a clientele who has a habit of like uh, buying these purchases. Because we in this um, survey that we did, asking people questions, one of the questions was also that how much would you be prepared to pay for digital? Many said uh, zero, but the kind of like maximum was... Um, 50% of the value of a live event, but more like 20% of the value of a live event or something like that. Yeah, I think 50% would be high. But I think yeah. 20%. I think most people now understand that um, it does cost money to put things on. And most yeah. people think if they if you lived in uh, Lisbon, you're not going to go to uh, Tallinn to watch a gig. But if you can watch that gig and get add-ons, so it's mm -hmm. a gig, but you've also got the backstage, maybe an interview with a band, which no one else gets. So yeah. it's like a, a gig plus. Maybe that makes people oh. more interested. And maybe there's an interaction thing as well. So the person in Lisbon could actually ask a question and they mm. get like this, a digital direct contact with the people. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my main concern is that uh, after this lockdown period, aren't people kind of tedious of this, like sitting in front of their computers? That's my main concern because I personally feel that, you know, I, I want to do anything but, stare at the computer <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I'm hoping not everybody feels that way and another thing is also that um, you can commit people's time in a different way like this you know if otherwise if, if Italian music is physical you can fly people in and they're with you three days non-stop and you have their attention but if you're there at home you can get, I don't know, small bites of time, let's say an hour and day or something like that. So, and, and also their concentration level is not going to be the same because you're at home, you're kids, you go do lunch, you do wash dishes. <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of, you don't get this focus from people. That's my concern. But okay, let's not be negative here. <laughs> no, I don't see it as a replication. I think it's a, it's an extra. Yeah, you, you think, well, yeah. The actual event itself is full on, but the people at home, you just have an hour for them. You don't even expect yeah. them to be there all the time. So you yeah. take it. It's, it's, it's a different version of the same thing, isn't it? It's yeah. like watching a gig on TV. It's in a little box. It doesn't sound as good, but you'd still watch it if you weren't there. Yeah. I mean, loads of people yeah. watch Glastonbury, and actually in the end, a lot of people prefer being at home watching Glastonbury than actually being there in the rain. So it's it becomes a different, different version of the same experience, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's like the when we sent this newsletter out two days ago that uh, we rec reconfirmed the dates. I started, you know, messages started pouring in from people who, you know, haven't visited us for ten years or something. That no matter what happens, we want to come this year. You know, it's, it doesn't matter how much it costs the flight tickets and everything. We want to come. And I was a bit like, it's a little bit scary because I don't know if I should encourage that type of travel in a time like this. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> Everybody who is missing all the conferences and festivals the whole season is going to end up at our door. <laughs> it's, good. it's kind of like, I don't know if it's good or dangerous. <laughs> so that's the thing. Well, it's great they want to get there, but they're going to have to get over a lot of hurdles to actually get there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah and yeah. it's going to be kind of tricky to ask people to kind of provide medical reports <laughs> to come here. I don't know. It's strange. No, but people know that's how it works now. People people would actually be relieved that it's going to be that strict. I think if it's, that, if it's easy to get in, people think, I'm going to catch something there. You yeah, know? yeah, 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 exactly. I would feel that way as well. I, I would want to know that whoever is in charge is just kind of like minimizing all the risks they can. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, and yeah, I think people expect, we'll, we'll be totally expecting that. And also I think a lot of people will be glad to take a test if they can find one anywhere to get a test. Yeah. Yeah, the thing is that we can't do it that way that uh, you get the test in Estonia because then the Estonian medical uh, sort of department would be in charge of kind of uh, putting these people into Estonian hospitals. And that's their weakest point. You know, everybody's, every country's kind of uh, ability to deal with the virus has to do with the amount of hospital beds available. So nobody wants any tourists in their hospitals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's fair enough, I think, isn't it? Yeah. I think even the quarantines, they should be done in the country before you leave instead of the country you're going to. Yeah, but I don't know if it then um, it a lot of pressure. Minimizes, I mean, minimizes the risks. You know, if 2,000 people went to Estonia and they all had to do quarantine, where, where would you put them all? Hotels would be happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, but I mean, of course, the whole... Uh, I'm just, uh, it's the hotels and the travel businesses that are so severely hit. I mean, our partners as hotels as well. I mean, they're all just, they're they're all literally like one month away from a bankruptcy. So especially the Estonian uh, capital owned. And uh, of course, they're really hoping to get the tourism working. But it shows how uh, thin the veneer of capitalism is, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. And uh, what I don't understand, and I would want somebody to explain to me, every single country has these huge bailout packages. Where does all this money come from suddenly? (laughs) (laughs) Because most of the time it's like this, that, you know, there's some countries who are doing good at the times when other countries are doing really bad. And, you know, I understand the logic that you kind of like balance the resources but now at the time when everybody's collectively doing awfully and mm-hmm. everybody, n- nearly everybody has put through kind of like uh, hum- humongous uh, bailout plans. Just kind of, literally, where does this money come from? So this is what I want to find out. <laughs> yeah, people are asking that here because a few years ago, people were asking on the left for money and the prime minister said, we don't have a magic money tree. That was her phrase. Yeah, exactly. I never say what's proven wrong now. <laughs> where did it appear from? <laughs> exactly. The other thing I never understand is where does all the money go? Because if everything stops, the money's still there. It just moves around, doesn't it? <laughs> of course. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It moves around. But like at a moment like this, when it, it's when it's everybody's in a minus, you know, I don't. Well, okay. They can't look, but, yeah, but it's it's all still there, isn't it? All the all the money's still piled up somewhere. It just isn't moving about, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I was just looking at these bailout ba- plans in our country. Even you know, it's like one company just got two hundred thousand, two hundred million yesterday. No uh, problem. <laughs> yeah, it's the, same here. It's just, the, the, the figures are in trillions. You think? No. Yeah. So pretty amazing. I think they're all speculating on the V, the V-shaped bounce. You know, we crashed and come up really quickly again. Yeah. But hopefully, when they're coming up really quickly again, it's not like a, a race to the bottom to get there, which is basically what Trump's going to do in America, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But eventually, it's it's another stock market crash uh, coming out again because it's it's the banks that are guaranteeing these loans. Mm. And in the hope of economy to start growing at some point really fast, mm. if it doesn't, then... 
then, then it gets interesting. <laughs> then, then, then it gets interesting. The, I think this is actually when the change will happen. Because it, actually I'm quite irritated by the fact that things have returned to normal so fast. Yesterday evening, it was Friday in Deliski, I left the office like 8 p.m. All the bars and like the courtyards and everything were full of people drinking, smoking, as if nothing ever happened, you know. Parking lots full of cars. Again, you know, it's it's the same business as usual. Wow, so, it's not like that here. It is here and it's worrying because it might mean that in two weeks, uh, you know, we have a sharp increase of the virus again and then well, there's no Italian music week. Spanish flu, that's what happens. When it, people start going out again, then the second wave came. But it, it had to mutate into a worse version, which this one hasn't done so far. But we have to be careful. No, nobody ever asks the virus what it thinks about anything, does it? <laughs> yeah. You could go sit yeah. in the bars, but the virus hasn't gone away. It just sort of, it's just slightly less... It's just slightly less amounts of transmissions, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks, that Helen. Okay, so there's me uh, moving cup. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the scary one. I only had this small main. Oh, that, that was based on a, a Finnish folk tale, isn't it? Yeah. I I know moments really well, but this uh, I can't remember what na- the name of this monster you have there. Yeah. This is the Groke. Gro- Broke. 